Hello again. In our first e-lecture about distinctive features, we examined the different approaches towards the definition of features from a historical perspective. In this follow-up e-lecture, we will discuss today's system of distinctive features and we will show how distinctive features can be used to define natural classes, phonological rules and phonotactic statements. Let us start with a detailed look at today's most popular distinctive feature systems. Distinctive features constitute a limited set of phonological segments assumed to be part of universal grammar. The set of principles for language all humans are endowed with innately. Distinctive features are associated with a unary that is a single valued or a binary value and are by convention enclosed in square brackets. By and large they are based on Jacobson's definition of acoustic features and on the sound pattern of English approach as defined by Chomsky and Halle. In order to develop a system of distinctive features for the existing vowels and consonants, we first of all have to find out the minimal number of features we need. So, how many features do we need? Well, there is a relatively simple formula to calculate the number of features for a given set of items. This formula says, take the square root of n, that is, the number of items you want to define generate the integer value and add the number one. Here are two examples. To find out the number of features we need to distinguish the 16 cardinal vowels we have to take the square root of the number 16 which is of course 4. The integer value of 4 is also 4 and then we add 1, so the result will be 5. So to define the 16 cardinal vowels, we need 5 distinctive features. Let's play the same game for the roughly 90 consonants we need. So n would now be 90. The square root of 90 is roughly 9.5. The integer value of 9.5 is 9, we add 1, so we get the number 10. So to define the roughly 90 consonants that exist in the languages of the world, in terms of distinctive features, we would need 10 features at minimum. Okay, so much for our formula and for the calculation. To distinguish vowels and consonants from one another, the superordinate feature consonantal is normally used. So vowels or vocalic features are all minus consonantal and their five features refer to the articulatory definition of vowels. We know that from the definition of cardinal vowels, you will see that in a second. Consonantal features, by contrast, are marked with the feature plus consonantal. As we've just calculated, we need 10 features at minimum to define consonants and by and large the consonantal features are grounded in the active articulator. Let us start with vocalic features. The parameters used for the phonetic classification of vowels high, low, front, back, can be translated into phonological features on a direct one-to-one -one basis. Vowels which involve a high tongue position are defined by means of the feature plus high. Vowels that do not have a high tongue position are associated with the feature minus high. And the same applies to low. Low vowels receive the feature low and all those vowels which are not low 
are defined as minus low. The feature back is obviously associated with back vowels and the feature minus back is associated with all front vowels. And last but not least we have the feature round which defines all those vowels that are produced with rounded lips and minus round defines all those vowels that are produced with spread lips. Let us look at some selected vowels. Cardinal number one would be defined as plus high minus low, minus back and minus round. Cardinal number five, R, would be defined as minus high, plus low, it is a back vowel plus back, and minus round. And if we take O, cardinal number seven, we would get a vowel which is minus high and minus low. It is a back vowel and it is produced with rounded lips. Now the same applies to O, cardinal six, it's also minus high, minus low, plus back and plus round. So how do we distinguish these two from one another? Well, remember, we need five features. And here is the fifth. In order to obtain the four degrees of height, high, mid-high, mid-low, low, the feature which is encoded in the system of cardinal vowels, the additional binary feature ATR, which stands for advanced tongue root, was introduced. Now we can draw a distinction between mid-high and mid-low vowels and we have added feature number five as calculated by our formula. So here is O once more, cardinal number seven which is now plus ATR and O which is identical with O except that it is now minus advanced tongue root. Since all vowels are minus consonantal they automatically imply the major class feature plus sonorant and plus syllabic. These features were already introduced in the sound pattern of English approach in our first e-lecture on distinctive features. Let us now look at the consonantal features that are used today. Consonantal features make reference to the active rather than the passive articulators. This grounding is not arbitrary since only active articulators such as the tongue, the lips, the uvula and the glottis are believed to be associated with cognitive substance. The passive articulators by contrast remain motionless. Modern consonantal feature systems are based on the sound pattern of English approach authored by Noam Chomsky and Maurice Halley. However, Whereas in the sound pattern of English system all features were binary, today's system of consonantal features include single-valued or unary articulation features. Depending on their function within the system, the consonantal features can be subdivided into two classes. You know them already. The first of them is the so-called major class or the major class features. And here the feature sonorant defines all those speech sounds that have a high amount of sonority as plus sonorant. That is the three highest vowels, liquids and nasals are plus sonorant. The two lowest fricatives and plosives are minus sonorant. The feature plus continuant defines vowels, glides, trills and fricatives as plus continuant, plosives and laterals are minus continuant. And then almost self-explanatory, the feature voice correlates with vocal cord action. A speech sound has the feature plus voice. If the vocal cords vibrate, it has the feature minus voice if the glottis is open. And the last major class feature is nasal, obviously it refers to nasal consonants. Sounds are produced by lowering the velum and allowing air to pass outward through the nasal cavity. Non-nasal or oral sounds are produced with the velum raised to prevent the passage of air through the nose. The second class of features are cavity features, typical articulatory features. 
One of them is lateral and obviously this feature refers to those consonants that are produced with a lateral manner of articulation, the most familiar of which is of course the alveolar lateral consonants. They are produced to allow the air to pass over one or both sides of the tongue. The feature labial is a unary feature. That is a feature with a single value only. It is associated with all those consonants that involve the lips as an active articulator. Thus, bilabial and labiodental consonants are assigned the feature labial. Let us now look at the typical placement feature. The feature coronal was discussed at length in our first e-lecture on distinctive features. It was introduced by Chomsky and Halle in the sound pattern of English approach and refers to the activity of the blade of the tongue. This involves all those sounds that are produced between the dental and the palato-alveolar region. The feature anterior is associated with all those coronal consonants which are produced with a primary constriction located at or in front of the alveolar ridge, that is, with label, labial, dental or alveolar consonants. And the feature distributed, well, that's the other side of the coronal area. It refers to all coronal consonants that are produced with a constriction that extends for a considerable distance along the mid-sagittal axis of the vocal tract. In other words, the feature distributed refers to the distribution of the tongue over the passive articulator typical for dental and post-alveolar consonants. And finally we need a feature to define velar consonants and the feature that has been chosen here is referred to as dorsal. It defines sounds articulated with the body of the tongue against the velum. The use of the term dorsal rather than velar follows the principle to refer to the active articulator rather than the definition of features on the basis of passive articulators. Let us finally discuss the question why we need distinctive features. Well, distinctive features can be motivated in several ways. On the one hand, we can discuss the efficiency and scientific adequacy with which phonological phenomena can be described. On the other, we may find psychological support for distinctive features, a question which we will neglect in this particular e-lecture. So let's look at natural classes first. A natural class is formally defined as a family of segments that share the same set of properties. Well, here is an example. Here we have three consonants. Obviously, we all know these are voiced plosive consonants. And with phonemes, the maximum generalization for these consonants is exactly that. It is a class of voiced plosive consonants. Compare this definition with the far more informative class of distinctive features, plus voice, minus sonorant, minus continuant. Such a class statement is required, for example, to state the process of spirantization between vowels found in many languages, the process where a plosive consonant changes into a fricative while maintaining its place of articulation. For example, um, Clusters like ada may become aza and eventually aza. Ada, aza, aza. Here is a second example. Now, the voiced consonants shown here are required to state the process of final devoicing in German. With phonemes, no further generalization than just listing them is possible. Sometimes, Phonologists refer to this set as the set of voiced obstruents. Using features, however, these segments constitute a highly simple and informative natural class, namely the class of voiced and minus sonorant consonants. In these and many other cases, the use of distinctive features allows a much more adequate class definition 
than the use of phonemes. Well, and the formulation of phonological rules, even though it may be of some use in pedagogical grammar if we use phonemes, can be shown to be much more informative and much simpler if we use distinctive features. And even more so, the linguistic val value of such statements is, in terms of phonemes, often not helpful when we want to find particular sound patterns. Consider the following example in English. Plural formation. We have examples such as cat and cats, dog and dogs, and then bus buses, rose, roses, church, churches, and judge, judges. A proper statement requires that we specify the phonological contexts for the respective allomorphs. Using phonemes, the morphophonemic rule that defines the context for the allomorphs would have to list the phonemes in each case. For example, the use of the allomorph is requires the listing of the phonemes that can occur prior to the word boundary and are followed by the plural morpheme and this morpheme would then be realized as is with distinctive features this is relatively simple we only define a natural class for the most specific context, that is the class of continuant minus sonorant and plus coronal consonants. So if any consonant shares these three features, it qualifies for the context that needs is as the plural allomorph. Well, and the remaining two contexts are relatively simple. We only have to specify the feature plus or minus voice to define the particular allomorphs. Here is another example, the example of coalescent assimilation in received pronunciation. The examples are well known. We bet you becomes bet you, we fed you might be realized as fed you, miss you may become miss you, please you may be realized as please you. With phonemes, we have to list the particular elements that occur prior to the palatal approximant. T, d, s, and z may become ch, j, sh, and j if a palatal approximant follows. Now compare this with a statement of distinctive features. Using features, we can once more state a natural class that changes one feature, the feature anterior from plus anterior to minus anterior in the context prior to a palatal approximant. In these and many other cases, the statement of the respective rule in terms of features allows a more adequate representation than a formulation based on phonemes. And the same applies to phonotactic statements. Phonotactic statements are concerned with restrictions on the patterning of sound segments in the syllables of any given language. Syllables in English, for example, impose constraints on their onset structure. That is, we want to find out what can occur in the onset, that is, in the position prior to the peak. Here are some examples. We have syllables with nothing in the onset, a syllable such as in. We may have one consent, consonant in the onset. Ring is an appropriate example. We may have two consonants in the onset, bring or even three, spring. Now, especially if we have more than one consonant, but even with one consonant, we have to postulate particular restrictions or constraints about what can occur in the syllable onset. Here is a special case. A consonant plus a labiovelar approximant. Twin would be an example. Now, if we list all possibilities of 
consonant clusters that involve a labiovelar approximant, we find this pattern. Dwell, queen, gwen, swell and thwart are possible and the remaining consonant plus approximant combinations are impossible. But what distinguishes this set that is possible from that which is impossible? In terms of phonemes we would have to list those combinations that are impossible. With features this is relatively simple. Consonants that have the feature labial cannot occur in succession in the syllable onset. Again, phonological generalizations are much simpler with features than with phonemes. Well, let us summarize. Our two e-lectures on distinctive features should have achieved the following main goals. First, they should have given you an idea what distinctive features are, how they were introduced to phonology from a historical point of view and how they are used today. Secondly, and this has been a major focus of this particular e-lecture, I hope to have illustrated that especially in theoretical phonology, distinctive features are more useful than phonemes. Classes and rules can be defined more efficiently and phonotactic statements can be made with ease. This does not mean that the phoneme is out as a fundamental segment in phonology. However, from a theoretical point of view, there are numerous arguments in favor of the distinctive feature.